Good afternoon and welcome to the uh, Lifetime Straving Stream supported by, uh, supported by Close Brothers. Um, my name is Tim Gosling, I do DC Policy at the Association. Uh, and I'm joined on stage by uh, Jeanette Makings from Close Brothers, um, uh, David Finch from the Resolution Foundation and Saka Hussain from PwC Workplace Benefits. Um, I will periodically be looking at the iPad down to my side. Um, that's because I'll be looking at the conference app, which will have questions on it, hopefully from all of you, which you can, you can feed in via the app, and I'll feed into the panel discussion as we, as we go along. Um, so I guess my starting point here in, 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 uh, for in, in thinking about all of this was it, millennials get a fairly tough press. Um, seemingly every day popping up in, in, my, in my news feed, I get a, uh, an article denouncing millennials as, as pampered snowflakes who didn't do enough competitive sport at school. And so I thought I'd kick the tires on that a little bit. And I did some research on the internet, and I came up with a quote variously attributed to either Socrates, Plato, or Aristotle, depending on what website you're looking at, um, that damned the youth of Athens for um, lack of respect to their elders um, and various other, various other perceived, perceived faults. This stuff has a long pedigree. And you can see that through the 18th and 19th century as, as outraged bishops in, in the House of Lords denounced um, the youth for, uh, for, for, for drunkenness, for fighting, for swearing, and, and most, mo most notoriously of all for um, you know, women for riding astride a horse. So all this, all, the, all this stuff, it seems to be a, 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 a constant of, 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 our, of, our, of cultures through the ages, that the, 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 old, the old look at the youth with a, a, quiz, a quizzical and sometimes slightly envious eye, perhaps. But the purpose of this session is to put all that sort of pop sociology to one, one side and look, take an honest and hard look at how to engage millennials with their... Uh, with, uh, with, 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 their, with, their, with their lifetime savings and with their, and with their pension entitlement. And a, an honest and hard look at the, the headwinds and some of the difficulties that millennials may face in engaging with their savings and indeed in some cases making savings at all. Um, so that's enough from me. I'll turn to, uh, turn to Jeanette who's going to say a little bit about Close Brothers perspectives on the issues. Afternoon, everybody. Um, so, so I'm going to continue probably Tim's theme a little bit by, by being a bit controversial. Um, I, we do hear a lot of bad press about millennials, uh, and I, I, I don't think they're that much different to, to any of us, really. Uh, I, I'm clearly not a millennial, so I can say that. But I think that the differences, clearly there are some differences in the way that they interact with the world, uh, you know, WhatsApp versus the home telephone line, their defining events are 9-11 in the Iraq war rather than uh, the moon landing, for example. Um, so I think there are differences in the way that they use communications and interact with the world. But in what they're trying to achieve, in trying to achieve their potential, in trying to make their stamp on the world, in trying to make their way through the world and contribute to society, some of these things, I think, are the, exactly the same uh, as previous generations. <coughs> They might go about it in a slightly different way. Um, so so I, I have that view of millennials. I think the other thing that I would say uh, in, in, about millennials is that in terms of their lifetime savings and pensions, whilst DB hasn't been totally left behind now, these guys will never know DB, the vast, vast majority of them. So they will know a, a defined contribution pension environment. And actually, in that sense them and Generation Z are almost in the most fortunate people in the workplace. Because as long as the intervention is early and as long as they are engaged early enough, they have potentially got 60 years or more of investment timelines. Nobody else in the workplace has that. And as we know, with, the, with compound interest and that sort of investment horizon, almost as long as we get it right at the beginning, the world is their oyster. So I'm, I'm, I'm yay, for, yay for millennials, and let's, let's put some effort behind them and, and let them um, make their way with haste. Um, so um, I, just building on that, I mean, uh, at the Resolution Foundation, um, we're currently supporting something called the Intergenerational Commission, which is looking at fairness between generations and also within generations. So for us, um, there's clearly a kind of living standards challenge for millennials, um, and that's one now. And into the future as well over their lifetime. But um, for, from our perspective, it's also understanding that through um, how other generations have fared as well across different ages and life stages. Um, 
and again, both now and in the future, and looking at within those generations too. So although there is clearly a this living standard challenge for millennials, um, and pensions forms part of that, but we're also looking more widely at things like the labour market um, and the housing wealth potentially in the future, and then eventually coming to some policy conclusions to help to um, try and ensure fairness between generations. Um, it's really important that I, I think you consider the challenge for millennials in light of the challenge um, across all generations into the future as well. Yeah, I think I agree with what Jeanette said actually earlier on. You know, I think the, the millennials uh, are often, it's often said that you know they need things differently and they expect things differently. But actually, I'm not sure they actually do. And I think you know one of the comments you often hear is millennials have got it harder than past generations. But again, I don't think they do. Uh, I think just expectations are different. Uh, so I'm sure if you looked at uh, your baby boomers and you looked at Generation X as we have now, I'm sure the baby boomers at the time said, God, these Generation X people expect a lot, don't they? But actually, it's just evolution. It's just things changing. And actually, all that's really changing is expectations. Uh, and I think that is going to be the challenge about how uh, the workplace today deals with the expectations of the millennials, who, in the, from their perspective, it's not an expectation. It is a norm. Uh, and I think it's very interesting just to see, from my perspective, in the work that I do at PwC, which is the first started was very much focused around defined contribution pensions and that was we need people in the pension scheme and we need them to get to save as much as they possibly can but actually uh, that is starting to shift and it's more around sort of broader savings and it's more around financial well-being and actually how do we support millennials and other parts other people in the organization through their journey their financial journey through their life so we've got three sort of reasonably reasonably similar um, uh, perspectives on the similarity of millennials to actually previous generations. We're not looking at a, a radical generational, <coughs> radical generational shift in the, in, in the view in the view of the panel. But you know, I think of my own experiences. I was fortunate enough to go through university in the days before tuition fees, um, and also you know my generation, many of my generation were fortunate enough to get on the property ladder ahead of um, the rapid increase in, in house prices we've seen over much of the last much of the last decade. David, I was wondering if you could give a perspective on the kind of, on the, the different econo how the how the economy is 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 affecting millennials, and perhaps the different perspective that millennials may have as a result of that. Sure. Um, I mean, I think I think the big thing for millennials is more about the kind of labour market that the the challenges in the labour market that they face, and also the kind of wider demographic change as well. And I think it's those things that are really different compared to maybe previous generations. So, millennials especially. Um, well, everyone's been hit with a, with a um, prolonged and now returned pay squeeze um, um, in the wake of the financial crisis. But it was young people were hit the hardest by that. So they had the biggest squeeze, and it also came at a really important time in their, um, in their career history. So it's at the exact point at which you'd expect them to be making quite rapid career progression. Actually, they didn't make that progression. And when we compare the earnings of, um, of millennials to older generations, at the same age, they're now falling behind um, where older generations were at that same point. Whereas before that, we'd always seen successive generations doing better than their parents had. So that's a really kind of key issue that I think is really at the core of many of the challenges facing millennials into the future. Um, and kind of grappling with that and putting everything else in that perspective is really important. But additionally, they also have this challenge of demographic change, and it's something that, um, say if we take baby boomers, it's something that they didn't face during their working life. So millennials have a much bigger, um, older population to support. Um, and so throughout their working life, there's a risk that that um, adds a much greater burden on their, on their incomes and living standards and you know, their opportunities to save um, compared to previous generations who had a much smaller cohort of older people to support. So I think it's those two kind of really big, um, wider issues that are, that are kind of driving the differences for millennials rather than a kind of um, you know, them themselves being different in their outlook and perspective than previous generations might have been. So, Janet, how far do you recognise that characterisation? If, if it's something you recognise, what do you feel it's doing to millennials' um, outlooks, the way they look at their, the way they look at their, the way they plan their life, the way they look at they plan their, they, they plan their, they plan their financial behaviours? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, I agree with the point. It's, millennials have grown up generally in, uh, in the post-2008 world, the working life, certainly where there's been recessions and money has been tight. So actually that then, let's go back to this word experience and expectation. 
so I, I think our view really is that when it comes to millennials, they're more interested in an experience rather than more material aspects that maybe uh, generations before them uh, were focused on. You know, if you go back to uh, go back to the baby boomers, you know, when they were working, actually, what was their focus? It was really around the company, uh, and many of the baby boomers have stayed with companies for 30, 30 40 years. And in that environment, the final salary scheme really works because actually it provides and it gives you an expectation, back to that word, around what you might get in retirement. But I think when it comes to Generation X, it's probably move around employers a lot more. So I think it's more around your career. So it's thinking about actually how uh, is my career going to be best served and they might be moving to different places. And then you've got millennials, uh, which I think are more interested in having a, a life experience uh, and more interested in community. And the word community, I guess, you know, has different connotations attached to it. But I think that's where their focus uh, generally comes from. Yeah, and I think it's interesting. There's two points I'd pull out from that. If we think about career and, and longevity and perhaps the sort of 100-year life expectation, um, you know, will they only have one career? Or are, are they preparing themselves as they enter the workforce for possibly two careers or even three careers? Uh, and I think that's something that a lot of them are thinking about. Uh, and, you know, they're struggling with where they fit in society, where, they, where their role fits, and actually looking and kind of deciding, well, this doesn't necessarily need to be forever. And if I've got that longer time frame in the workplace, uh, I, I can afford to try some things out and see how they go. Um, the other thing I'd say as regards financial, um, I guess the answer is we don't know at this point. You said this is the first generation where they haven't done better than their parents. I'd, I guess we don't know whether that's a, a bad thing or actually whether it's the trend levelling off. Uh, we're not sure yet because we haven't got into that time frame of being able to analyse what that means. But I do think in terms of actually managing finances, um, we're seeing a lot more millennials. They will perhaps get their, their money in a different way to previous generations. So, for example, just, as, just to sort of bring that to life, really, there are more, um, more of their parents' generation who are helping them to get on the housing ladder more so than any other generation before them, giving them chunks of capital to help them uh, get into the housing market. Uh, there are more parents and grandparents starting them off in a savings fund of some kind, whether that be a pension or some other savings fund. And there are more parents and families leaving them inheritances. It may not be massive inheritances, but something, more, more so than any previous generation. So, Whilst it's a, it's a different way and a different timeline of receiving that capital injection, they are going to have a different journey in that respect to previous generations. Just picking up on that last point, are we seeing any other sort of financial differences that make them distinct from what the Gen X, my generation, the boomers that went, that went, befo that went before? So we've, we've just uh, released some research today, which is the Lifetime Savings Challenge, uh, in, in conjunction with the PLSA, actually looking at some of the, the trends in lifetime savings. And as we know, that's not just about pension, that's about lots of other things now. Uh, and interestingly, as, as we released it to the, to the, the conference this morning, um, of the three demographics in the workplace, so 18 to 34-year-old, 30, 35 to 54-year-old, 50, and 55 plus, the group that are saving the most regularly on a monthly basis are the 18 to 34-year-olds which shocked the conference, shocked the people in that session. Uh, and they're saving, on average, £286 a month. In addition to that, they've got £15,000 in other saving outside of their pension, and they've got £36,000 in a pension. So this is not a generation that is shying away from planning, mm. their, for planning their finances and planning their money. This is not a generation that's shying away from saving, despite the fact that they have about £12,000 on average, £800 debt. So this is not a generation that's shying away from that responsibility. Actually, they're looking at it very much more seriously and, and realising that they have the power to do something about it. Do we feel that that, that sort of... That, that that financial responsibility, I've got to say, is, is, a, is a surprise to me as, as a, you know, a surprise to me as somebody who you know, looks at research on this on a regular, reasonably regular basis. Um, does the... Do we do we get a sense as to why that is? I mean, is that is that linked is that linked to having things like student debt and so on and so forth forced on them as realities at a comparatively early age in comparison to the the the, the relatively gentle entry my generation had into the the world of adult finance? I was, I, 
I mean, I wonder if it's more related um, back to something like housing, where actually, um, so potentially people are saving, and it's because they need to save up if they want to get a deposit for their house. So work um, we've done suggests that I think um, about 20 years ago, it could take about two or three years to save up a deposit for a first home. And now it's more like about 19 years um, if you're taking kind of the same proportion of your savings, same proportion of your income that you're saving um, each month. And so perhaps some of that build-up of savings is because people are trying to get on the housing market. Um, and when we've looked at the kind of all different types of wealth that um, different generations are building up and have built up in the past, actually something like pensions, um, millennials and kind of younger generations actually look fairly similar to um, older generations at the same age. Um, there's not like a huge overlap in some of the data there, so it's not, um, you can't, it's, you can't quite conclude that they're saving as much as the baby boomers, but at a kind of typical level, actually, those kind of savings are quite good. Where you see the really big difference um, is all in home ownership. Um, and you're now, I think it's now twice as likely um, to be in the private rented sector than people were. Um, so someone in their 30s today is around twice as likely to be in the private rented sector than, say, the baby boomer generation were at the same age. Um, and all these factors are really important for their kind of overall living standards. Um, one of those is that um, in a private rented sector, your housing costs are more are higher than if you're a homeowner. So that's another burden on your kind of overall income. Um, but if we look at kind of wider resources and kind of access to other means of savings, um, the kind of the big driver of housing wealth has been this kind of a, what looks to be a historical one-off gain in the value of property since the kind of late 90s. And it looks very unlikely that future generations would enjoy a similar kind of growth in, in that wealth. And so for, for people who aren't saving, and particularly if we think about the self-employed who maybe in the past have relied on housing wealth rather than a pension, um, that kind of avenue of support may not be there for many. So I think um, I, in a kind of overall financial, um, if we're looking at um, the overall kind of finances of millennials, then actually it, it, it comes to um, much greater, there's a much greater kind of emphasis on them to save beyond housing um, if they want kind of support over their lifetime. I, I also, yeah. <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I also wonder whether it hasn't, you know, fa financial awareness hasn't been on the school curriculum until quite recently, but these people, these people will have lived through the, the 2008 crash and they'll have lived through all the years that we've had since then. They'd have also had their parents and their families talking to them about this. It's been in the media. Uh, you know, they are very socially aware. Uh, and so I, th I, I wonder whether that's played its part as well in raising their awareness of, of the need to take responsibility personally and, uh, and do something about it. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I think uh, just, just my experience as well, I think millennials do tend to be quite <coughs> financially savvy. Because uh, you know there's been an environment where a lot of them have been at university, they've had to pay pay debt, they've had to pay for that, so they've had to think through what those costs are, so they've had to think about their finances. And rather interestingly, within PwC, when we looked at our distribution of uh, who was paying into the pension scheme and, and what people were paying in. We were quite surprised, you know, similar to the research that you got, is actually it was our under 23 year olds, people that just left university, that were some of the highest contributors to the pension plan. Uh, which we thought was great. Obviously, they recognised the value of pensions, but actually then when we really dug down into it, it's because they were able to bring their threshold down to, to knock down, having not have to pay the student loan back, which was A, was good, <laughs> very clever, so I employed them. Uh, but B, it demonstrated that financial savviness, so they, were, so, they are, so they are thinking about their money. I think the question then becomes, how are they saving and where are they saving? And actually, is pension the right savings vehicle? But I think we, we have got a... Uh, a generation today that understands the value of saving. And I think the last point I'd make on this as well is that, you know, one of the terms that's often labelled uh, against uh, the millennials is, oh, they're very tech savvy. But I, I don't quite think that's the right term to use. I think they're tech dependent. Uh, their whole life has been digital. Everything they do is on their mobile. And because of that, you know, and uh, there's lots of websites out there you know, with, with credit cards today. There's lots of cashback people can get. So if you think carefully about how you spend your money, it's very possible to get some money back on how you spend it. So by being tech dependent, it's very easy for them to engage with that technology. And actually they realise, you know, if I'm going to buy, buy a holiday, I can get 2% back. If I buy it through a particular website, I'll do that and it'll give me 30 quid. So that, I think, is helping build that, that savings uh, momentum up. So you just mentioned uh, just moving moving things moving things on moving things on a little. 
Um, many of us were delighted when the first um, sort of evaluation report of automatic enrolment came out and showed that actually the highest uh, or the lowest opt-out rate was among the younger was among the younger generation. We couldn't quite work out exactly what was going on. So we were, we were delighted by that, albeit but our, our joy was uh, confined a little bit by the, you know, obviously the low level of, of contributions many are, many are making. So given that we've moved on a little bit to pensions, um, what sort of is the place of the pension in, among, 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 among millennials, millennial savings habit? How many, who, who, if any, thinks about their pension and to what degree are people engaged with it? So again, I think if, as long as they get the right... Um, information and, and education, I think, and guidance at, at an early enough stage, I think for everybody, pension still is the, the foundation and the mainstay uh, of providing for a, uh, a future income in retirement. Um, the benefits that you can get in a pension environment, uh, not the least tax relief, but certainly uh, deducted from um, gross salary uh, and also particularly uh, employer contribution you're going to struggle to find any other investment that's going to give you that sort of benefit. And I think if they, if, you know, if they understand that and, and grasp that concept, and again, going back to what I said earlier, the investment horizon, um, if particularly with pension freedoms, uh, if they're going to remain, if some of that pension is going to remain in drawdown whilst in retirement, you could be talking about six, 60 years of investment. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, uh, compound interest and uh, an investment framework being able to take a completely different uh, approach to risk in those early years because you've got such a long time horizon mm -hmm. um, if these sorts of things can be inculcated I think um, I, I think pension will be part of their savings savings future okay, I mean I think um, you can I think I would take the kind of sign the enrollment in um, Sort of DC pensions from auto enrolment that we've seen as a sign of engagement to some extent. And I suppose the big test is, um, and I should say first that usually we, um, when we look at generation um, things between generations, it looks millennials are usually falling behind other generations. But um, uh, auto enrolment's the one thing where actually um, millennials are exceeding other generations and more saving at that age. And it's uh, it's really quite a, it is a really big significant shift in in kind of saving patterns. But I suppose the big test is when. Um, those contribution rates start to rise. If um, you know, it will really be a test of whether um, it's a, it is actually a sign of a shift in savings behaviour, or if it's something that they haven't really noticed so far, gone along with, and suddenly start to back out of when it becomes um, a, a bigger chunk of their income, and when they're maybe having to weigh that against other things like you know, saving for your home, um, which is the other kind of big potential um, place where they might be putting savings at the moment. Sure, we should quick, quick challenge come through on the um, come through on the app. Um, We've talked quite a lot about um, people who are in, in continuous employment with access to a you know, with access to a pension a pension that way. Obviously, that's not the only experience this generation is having. You know, many people are employed in the in the so-called gig economy. We've got Matthew Taylor incidentally talking later about the the, the, gig, the gig economy and potential reforms to that 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 sector. Um, what do we feel about the experience of those, those individuals? How might their experience be different? Um, how might their engagement with financial, the finan financial services be, di be, be different as a result? Um, I, I, I'd like to say a bit on this because I think, um, and sort of slightly challenge the kind of obsession with the gig economy that people tend to have in that um, actually when you try and identify this gig economy and the kind of data, which is what we spend most of our time at Resolution Foundation kind of looking at data and spreadsheets, it's really hard to f identify some big group of people um, who have got lots of these mini-jobs and are self-employed. What we're actually seeing is, um, possibly <coughs> counterintuitively, is um, more people actually staying in their job for longer amongst young people. And, there, and because people aren't switching jobs, and that's often the way to get a pay rise, we think that's a big factor in why people's pay isn't growing as quickly. Um, and then the other shift we have seen is a big rise in self-employed. I think it's gone from just over around 3 million um, in 2000, up to around 5 million people self-employed. And that's a mix of older people kind of shifting into probably quite well-paid kind of self-employment, but then also quite worryingly about half of those people are in kind of lower paid and lowest, lower paid sectors like construction <coughs> doing self-employed roles. Um, and I think that's where the kind of Matthew Taylor <laughs> work is really important is identifying, you know, is that really self-employment and making sure that those people are being treated if they are working as an employee, actually treated as an employee, and getting the, the kind of entitlements to things like auto enrolment that um, 
that employees get as well. Just to pick up on that, it's certainly been the, the association's position and our, our response to the Taylor Review, um, we suggested that we should take a, 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 we should be looking to identify people who are in, in self in, you know, genuine self-employment and those whose self-employment status might be more questionable uh, and definitely look to automatically <coughs> enrol those who, who, who we think are, 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 are workers for the purposes of em, em, employment. Employment law. So it is something we are we are alive to. I hope Matthew has a few more things to say, say 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 later say say later about that. But we have one more coming th come through come through on the app. Um, a question about pension trustees. How far can trust how far can trustees? What should trustees do or do differently in order to engage with this generation? So I, th I think I think when you say that the role of the trustee has always been that its members understand uh, the benefit that's placed in front of them and how to interact with it responsibly, I think it's always been there. I think with defined contribution, uh, I think that, that those responsibilities are multiplied because the decision-making, a lot more of the decision-maker sits with the individual uh, and a lot of individuals feel ill-equipped to do that. So I think the trustee is there to ensure that the sponsor is doing as much as possible, to ensure the employer is helping as much as possible to ensure that um, individual members, the communication is, is appropriate, it's reaching all demographics, mm -hmm. uh, it's not just focusing on those who are approaching retirement, it's really, you know, we keep saying it, um, you know, what, 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 would, what would you tell your younger self at age 55? I'd tell them to start saving earlier. So, so you know, really trying to engage members throughout the whole uh, demographic and make sure they've got the right communications and the right support. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there that, that, that is there to help uh, and really making sure that sponsors are making members aware it's there to help. Trustees can have a role to sort of prod the sponsor. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the, the pension advice allowance, mm -hmm. the £1,500 that can be taken in, in, in three equal amounts of 500 mm -hmm. well, that could be taken at age 21 or 22. Mm -hmm. You know, where do I go? What do I do? How do I start? It can be taken at age 40. How am I doing? Am I on track? Where am I up to? And it can be taken at just you know, a couple of years out from retirement. You know, what should I do in these final years? So, so these types of things should be really make, making sure that every single member is aware of that and taking full advantage of these uh, opportunities to help themselves. So can I just, just, just add to that? I think it's becoming increasingly difficult for trustees, I think, because we're starting to get a real grey area between what's the employer's responsibility and what's the trustee's responsibility? Uh, you know, and historically, and I've seen it myself, the trustees would write out and communicate with members and say, look, you need to be paying more into your pension scheme, pay as much as you can. But actually, that might not be the right answer for everyone. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, paying into a pension might not be the right answer for everyone. You know, I think somehow you've got to look at it more broadly around what are the financial circumstances of people, which I know is very difficult for trustees to do because they've got their lens focused on the pension. And this is where the employer needs to be engaged as well. Because actually, you know, rather than trying to force people to pay more into a pension, it might be better off actually getting them to think about what debts they've got and helping to pay down those debts because that is more of a pressing concern than something, as Jeanette said, could be a 60-year you know, time horizon. So I think it's, I think it's becoming very difficult for trustees. So there's been a lot of excitement. Uh, I'm just taking 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 more from taking more from the app now. People are really contributing, which is is is, fant is fantastic. Um, a lot of excitement about the pensions dashboard. Um, we have another another session on on, on that on that late on that later. There's been a lot of excitement about um, robo advice, even if we're, we're we're yet to see sort of full advice products really come to come come to market. There's also a, you know a, a specific question here about um, whether and how it is possible to engage more with millennials um, through digital through digital tools. Um, is there a specific millennial angle to, 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 to digital, or is it just another is it just another channel? For me, it's just it's just another channel, but probably the primary channel because it's what they engage with naturally. Uh, you know, and I think there's a big challenge out there around how do you actually digitise what we do and how do you engage people and what the best way to engage people is. Uh, but fundamentally, I think that's the track that we're going to have to go down if we want to engage millennials. Well, except in the fact I think they already are engaged and they are financially savvy, mm -hmm. I think what is really around is how you up their level of education to enable them to make better decisions. Sure, sure. 
And, and I, th I think, um, again, we, we touched on this in the research, uh, but, but I, th I think millennials use technology uh, for research principally uh, and for some interaction. But actually what the research has clearly told us is that uh, even, even millennials, six, 60, over 60% 60 of them, still want human interaction to allow them to disseminate. They, they, they say there's too much information available to them. There's information overload. You know, the mm. World Wide Web is a fantastic tool, but it gives us everything, not, not just what we need. Uh, so really to, to enable them to filter what's relevant for them uh, and to, to be able to, to see exactly how to use the information for their own purposes. So I think it's multiple levels, and I think it's, it's allowing them to, to do a lot of the heavy lifting themselves and do the research but then recognising that actually you also need to provide them with a way to interact that's relevant to them. So I was just going to just, just add one more thing. I think for, for me to make digital work, uh, it has to be transaction-led. So it's, you know, it's really good that we can educate people and we can show them this is what you need to be doing. But you know, it doesn't matter whether you're the millennial or Generation X or Baby Boomer, you know, people are time poor, especially millennials. You know, they've got their three hours a day that they need to spend on social media to keep up with the average. <laughs> So actually, can we engage social media in a different kind of way? And, and, mm -hmm. I, and I've seen some examples of some fintech recently, which does uh, embed itself within social media, uh, y y using some of the sort of Facebooks, etc., uh, and allows people uh, to transact through there and think about, actually, you know, if I do need to do something with my pension, yes, I get it, but I need to go away and do something, speak to someone, it's going to take mm -hmm. ages, I can't be bothered. But if I can just press a button and it's done for me, I'm far likely to engage. Because that, I mean, that speaks to, you know, there's a, the, the, it speaks to a, a, an app question to see, and also you know, one of my own personal concerns, which is that you, know, that you can build excellent digital tools, you can build excellent communications and engagement strategies, but they're no use if people don't actually hook in. I mean, yeah. other thing, what can, we, what, what can we learn about how to hook in millennials with the tools that we might, we, we might bring forward in the next few years? Personalization. You know, I mean, the pension providers, all the mainstream providers, you know, have spent millions uh, in building out platforms and trying to engage people. But when you look at their stats, you know, engagement levels are five percent if you're lucky. So people aren't using it because they are too generic. So I think, if, and I've seen this examples of this, but if you can personalise the content, you can personalise the message. You know, I, I get an email saying, "Sack, you saying, you know, you're paying X amount into your pension scheme. Do you know if you paid an extra fifty pounds a month, you could have Y? Do you want us to do this for you? Press this. Mm -hmm. That I think will get people engaged because it's personal." I also think there's a big thing with with this particular generation um, around um, being part of a clan. So, so you know, uh, it's good to be liked. It's good for others to like it. Uh, mm -hmm. They tend to follow trends of things that are trending. Um, so I think, you know, actually learning from each other and learning from, from their own groups, seeing that others are getting engaged by this, hearing from their friends um, about this rather than it being just given to them uh, out of the blue, really. Sure. I've got one, 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 final app, one final app question for this, 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 sort of in, this, sort of engagement, this sort of engagement segments, saying, OK, so we have a, an 18-plus generation who are, who are saving. And we think, in part, that that's because they've they've grown up in a much tougher uh, economic environment than than, than than my than my generation than my generation did. Does that does that say something about the power of positive versus negative messaging um, in terms of getting people getting people to getting people to save, or is that it, or or is or is the context something that we you know, has an effect, but is something that we can't really replicate in our own communications? So, I mean, if you go back 10 years and, you know, think about how employers and trustees communicated with people on their pensions, it was very sort of simple. You know, it, there wasn't really much thought given to, well, how much do people need to save, how much do they need in retirement, because the focus was still all around the defined benefit scheme and the communications around that. That has clearly shifted. So I think there's far more direct communications, more targeted communications, more relevant communications more than anything. Mm -hmm. But on top of that, for millennials, you know, They've got parents in Generation X who have never experienced a defined benefit scheme in their lives. Mm. They've been in DC the whole time. So you've got that reinforcement message of, you know, as Jeanette was saying, of people saying to people, you need to be saving because they've got their own experience of, I probably aren't saving enough and I've got no chance of getting there, but I can certainly help my, my kids out by reinforcing that message. So that reinforcement is coming from the company, it's coming from the trustees, it's coming from your parents, and actually it's coming from society as well. 
Sure. So w one quick one quick thing. If you if you have a if you have a question for the app, please 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 su please submit. But um, in the in the interim, um, moving on to talk about employer responsibilities. Um, and taking this in the broadest, not necessarily the, uh, the, the just the saving sense, but what sort of, what sort of responsibilities what do, it, do employers owe, do employers owe, owe, millennial, owe millennials, if, if, if any, beyond the legal duties? I, I think that they are, they are employees first and foremost. Um, which generation they sit in will determine perhaps how the methods they might try and use to engage them and how they, the communication methods, etc., but their employees first and foremost, and every employee in the workforce is, is as valuable as the other. So I think if we look at the, the impact of not engaging them, uh, the impact of poor financial well-being, et cetera, that doesn't just, that doesn't just impact the individuals themselves, it impacts the workplace. Uh, lower engagement, lower productivity, uh, higher absenteeism, et cetera. Possibly people not retiring at the end of their careers when, when they could or should um, so I think it's in an employer's interest um, to get everybody in the workforce engaged around um, their financial well-being. Uh, millennials along with that. And I think if, um, as I said, I think if they, if they do it in the right way and if they engage them early enough, I think millennials will value that. So some of the, some of the research I've been looking into around millennial behaviour, um, you know, they do value very much the mentoring, coaching approach uh, regarding their personal development. They're interested in their personal development. And I think if we can see this as almost an extension of that, as opposed to something that sits outside of it, um, mm -hmm. if they haven't come through the education system having financial awareness, the workplace is probably the first place they're going to, you know, they're going to actually experience this. They're going to have terms thrown at them like pensions and share plans and tax and all of this sort of thing. They're still very much in learning mode and absorption mode, so they're very uh, they're very open to to hearing about this. They're very open to being coached as to how to interact with these types of things. So I think, kind of almost that they don't have their habits set yet. Mm -hmm. So I think if that intervention can be there in the right way and really get to them, I, I think you know you, you you can set up such great habits from the go get. Zach, have you got a perspective on the employer's responsibility? Yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's worth almost just stepping out a little bit from just looking at the financial uh, aspect, the savings aspect. So, you know, I think there's an overall employment deal which, peop which people expect. So, so PwC, we are the h highest employer of graduates in the UK. So we have thousands of millennials. So it's a real big issue for us. So, so we need to think about how do we engage millennials. It's not just, we think, just around pensions, but actually it's around what are their expectations, back to that word again, of work life uh, being, as a, being as a millennial. You know, and so, we, you know, so we've shifted a lot of how we work. You know, for example, we've in effect done away with, with, with sort of your standard nine to five. People are free and there's that trust element to sort of come, come go as they please. But then we also then have to think about their financial well-being because that's part of what they just expect alongside all other support around mental health and physical health, etc. But then when you do start to think about, well, what do they expect? Well, it's also a case of what do they need? Uh, and it's back to this communication and engagement point. You know, as a millennial, you're probably going to switch off from the word pension, but you're probably going to switch on to the word savings. So actually, do we need to change the language around some of this stuff and start saying, well, actually, let's talk about your short-term savings, your medium-term savings and your long-term savings. And this is where we start to then think about, well, actually, pension is one part of that. It might be the right bit for you, it might not be the right bit for you, but what else is there out there? Uh, so, you know, lifetime ICES, I think, are going to have a, a far bigger part to play. Uh, and I think the big decision a lot of employers are going to have to start to take, uh, and certainly I think some are struggling with getting to this point, is to say to people, you know what, we're going to be agnostic to whether you take the money into your pension or we're going to put it in, allow you to put it into an ISA. There's some, point to some of the technical difficulties aside about how that would work. Uh, that is where I think employers are going to have to go if they want to truly engage millennials and put the trust in them to make a decision that they think is right for their stage in their current lives and where they expect to be in the future. I, I also think, going back to that, uh, going back to your earlier point, Sag, about the, um, the fact that they're very much looking for discounts and how they can, by, by, their, by their purchasing behaviour, they can affect a different outcome. I think at the point of recruitment, I think millennials are much more savvy about what the em employee value proposition is. So 
if I come to you, what are you going to give me? Yeah. And I think they're demanding a lot more from that particular recruitment process. You know, I speak from personal experience. I have a, I have a son who is indeed a millennial, uh, and he's about, he, he's, he's about to enter the workforce, and he's, he's saying, well, you know, I want to understand if they can tailor their program to, to me. I want to understand if there's going to be coaching involved, mentoring. I want to see what, what the value of the benefits are, uh, how that progresses over the first 10 years, etc. So I think they are... They're perhaps not shy in stepping forward and asking these sorts of questions, probably more so than previous generations who were just grateful to have a job. So really, I mean, it's, 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 been quite in, it's been quite interesting hearing some of the actually quite subtle differences there are between this generation, my generation, this, this coming, generation coming through now, my generation and, and the boomers. We've got a clear sense of them as having similar, similar aspirations, uh, perhaps counterintuitively um, greater level of, 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 pension, of pension savings than, 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 my, than my generation had. But then these, 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 sub, these subtle differences in attitude and outlook um, that are shaping the way we might engage with them. Is that a, is that a, fair, is that a fair summary? Am I, am I way off base with that? I think fair summary. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's yeah. a fair summary, actually. Sure, sure. So before, I mean, before, you know, uh, I'll, I'll ask one, 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 round of, one round of questions on that. If you have got anything you, 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 you're, you're keen to ask the panel, please, please, take, please take the opportunity. Um, I'd like to ask you in, in turn what one thing should um, people in the, in, in, in the room take away from this session if they, can, if, if, if they take one thing from it that they could do differently as a result of this, what would it, what would it, what would it be? I mean, mine from the PLSA perspective is as we begin to think about the 2018, it's the 2017 review of automatic enrolment in more depth. Um, we heard from Jamie Jenkins, um, Chris yesterday about, and Rustin yesterday about um, phasing, the impact of phasing um, and where we might need to go in terms of future statutory minimum contributions. Um, that's all very challenging, but actually we have a generation here that is facing enormous competing financial pressures, and we need to think about exactly whether they, you know, whether they can genuinely devote resources to the the level of contributions, the level of contribution, level of contributions needed. And you know, as a, from the from the policy from the policy perspective, I'm not sure we've yet got a good answer for a good answer for that and that's one thing I'm really going to take away and work on as we as we respond to the 2017 review. Um, I think also we'd really welcome perspectives on that um, as you all hopefully respond to our, our hitting the target consultation where we're talking about um, the, 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 the balance between the employer and the employee contribution and potentially the eventual level of, um, of, 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 the, uh, uh, of where statutory contributions might rest. So. It's given me a lot of it's given me a lot of food for thought, and that's how I think we'll be trying to work it into our into our into our policy into our policy approach as we as we go into, as we go into 2018. But as, as sort of as we as we get into the last few minutes, what one thing would you would you, would you suggest that people take away from this session? Help them do their jobs diff Help them do their jobs differently. Help them relate perhaps to millennials and the millennials they work with differently. Um. I'm going to come at it from the the financial aspect, as probably you would expect me to. Um. I think we need to help them with their lifetime savings challenges. Uh, I think they are saving, they're engaged with saving. We need to make sure that they are saving in the right place. Uh, and, that, and going back to what Seg said earlier, that's for short-term needs, for medium-term needs, and for long-term needs. Let's demystify that process for them. Let's take the confusion out of it. And let's make sure that every penny they save counts. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it comes back really to um, earnings and the kind of outlook for their living standards. So um, particularly for millennials who have had this kind of much bigger squeeze on their income, on their earnings, and have really hit their kind of, have had their career trajectories hit. If we want um, them to basically have the capability to save, then um, I think employers really need to think about providing kind of progression routes and opportunities for um, particularly kind of lower paid um, millennials to, um, to kind of progress up, boost their earnings, and make sure that they have this ability to kind of catch up their earnings into the future. I think that's kind of in becoming increasingly important when um, I kind of had the kind of Office for Budget Responsibility recently have kind of downgraded their kind of longer, their medium-term kind of productivity growth assumptions, and that's reflecting a kind of decade of 
what is, I think we can, it, depending exactly how you cut the data, you can say that kind of earnings growth in the last 10 years has been worse um, since Napoleonic times. I think if you're kind of putting it into that context and that now you haven't seen any lift back up since the financial crisis, um, and that's now being sort of taken into account more and more by, um, mm -hmm. by the OBR into what they think will happen in the future, then a kind of focus on basically trying to boost productivity and um, ensure that there's a kind of progression route for millennials is really vital to, um, you know, just to give them that underpin in the first place so that they can um, save enough. Yes, I mean, I guess if you wanted to be really, really bold, I'd absolutely just stop using the word pension because uh, I think that is going to really help you engage better, better with your millennials. And actually, not just about engagement, I think if you really do want to support the millennials, and actually I think it's more than just millennials, it's just Generation X as well, it's really around helping them with their broader financial uh, journey through life. It's helping them think through savings, it's helping them think through debt, helping them work out what, if they have got some money to put towards either saving or paying off debt, what the right thing to do is. If the answer is it should be about saving, then it's about helping them determine what type of savings vehicle it should be. If the answer is then pension, then it should be around, OK, let's make sure we've given you the best pension deal we can and we've given you the support that we need. If the answer is a pension, what is the vehicle, and then put some support around that. I think that will really engage people. But more importantly, you know, as those of you that have run pension schemes from an employer perspective, you know, you, you might be spending millions, hundreds of millions of pounds on your pension, but do you really think you're getting value back from that in terms of how the, uh, how the employees see it? And actually, you may find that you're not, and therefore, can you actually spend that money in a different way and get far better engagement and value for, back, for, uh, value for money on it? Super. I've got one final question from the app before we, before we, before we wrap up. Um, uh, colleagues suggesting that younger people are inspired to save by seeing the positive retirement experiences of, their, of, 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 some, of, their, of some of their grandparents. Um, has the panel witnessed anything, witnessed, anything, witnessed anything like that in their research or experience? Um, not that directly, but I think um, it might be that, and I think um, you mentioned this before, um, Sack, about seeing what their parents are doing, if we look at the kind of generation that are probably going to be going to have the least adequate retirement savings, it's um, the kind of um, the Gen X um, generation who has stuck between the two. So it's the millennials' parents who maybe are getting to retirement and realising they don't have enough, or getting close to retirement and realising they won't have enough in retirement to have what the kind of lifestyle they'd expect. And maybe that's actually in going the other way around. So a poor outcome is actually shocking them maybe into saving um, from their parents. Sure. So thank you all very much, and thank you all very much indeed for your for your for your questions. This has been a really interesting session. I've 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 learned a lot, and there as I mentioned a moment ago, certainly things I'll take away, feed into our policy work, and feed into colleagues um, running the hitting the target consultation. Um, I'd like to thank um, thank our panelists, Janet Makings, um, David Finch, and uh, Sagasain. Um, I'd also like to thank Close Brothers for their their support of the uh, their support of the lifetime lifetime savings stream, and I'd like to thank you all for being such an attentive audience. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.